Let's talk about Star Trek IV. Not that one. The one that actually exists. There we go. It feels cruel to force me to make that distinction. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home opened in theaters on Thanksgiving weekend 1986. It was the top grossing film at the U.S. box office that weekend. It was the highest grossing opening weekend for a Star Trek film up to that point. It went on to become the first Star Trek film to gross over a hundred million dollars and the last until 2009 and the highest grossing Star Trek film overall again until 2009, the year which saw the release of Star Trek the blockbuster reboot and first entry in the Kelvin Timeline series, or perhaps I should call it the Kelvin Timeline Trilogy, because there are only three of them. In addition to its commercial success, Star Trek IV was popular with critics. It got mostly positive reviews. In his review, Roger Ebert called it the best Star Trek movie to date. It racked up some award nominations, including 11 Saturn Awards nominations, of which it won two for Best Costumes and Best Special Effects. It was also nominated for four Academy Awards, at the time the most Oscar nominations ever for a Star Trek film, a distinction it now shares with the 2009 Star Trek. It didn't win any of those Oscars it was nominated for, but one of the nominations was for Best Cinematography, and it's still the only Star Trek film ever nominated in that category. In other words, Star Trek IV was a success. A big success. Perhaps a bigger success than anyone expected that a Star Trek movie would or could ever be. So what's up with that? Or, to phrase the question in a way that would make for a more algorithm-friendly video title, why was Star Trek IV The Voyage Home actually so successful? To answer this question in a way that justifies talking about it for as long as I'm going to talk about it, we need to begin with an understanding of why the question even needs to be asked in the first place. Why was Star Trek IV's success so surprising? For me, it boils down to one simple fact. Star Trek is not Star Wars. I mean, in terms of audience size, overall appeal to the general public, obviously Star Trek is not Star Wars in terms of its actual content. I'm talking specifically about the relative sizes of their cultural footprints. And from the moment it stepped onto the scene in 1977, the footprint of Star Wars has been a whole lot bigger. When a Star Wars movie opens, you expect it to be a blockbuster. And when it's not, that's viewed as an exception to the rule or a harbinger of a drastic shift in the audience's taste because historically, Star Wars movies have made tons and tons of money. Star Trek? Not so much. It's been successful, it's made money, it's attracted an audience. If it hadn't, they wouldn't have still been making it in 1986, and they definitely wouldn't still be making it today. But it's done those things on a much smaller scale. Star Wars changed the movie industry. Star Trek carved out a niche, or niche, depending on how sophisticated you want people to think you are. Star Trek's niche is larger and easier to find than most other niches, and it has made a significant impact on the broader culture, but its TV shows, films, novels, comics, etc., the works that Star Trek actually consists of, still play to a fairly specific audience most of the time. What made Star Trek IV different, what allowed it to be so much more successful than previous entries in the franchise, was that it was the first Star Trek project to have crossover appeal. Yes, the dragon Hollywood has been chasing ever since it realized how many people were willing to pay to spend two hours watching characters be scared of a big shark. Crossover appeal is what we call the quality that enables a creative work, a movie in this case, to reach beyond its target demographics or pre-existing fan base, if it has one, and break through to a wider audience. It's the elusive, evanescent, secret ingredient to commercial success at the largest scale. It's what enables blockbusters to bust all those blocks. Star Wars has pretty much always had it, at least on the big screen. The 2009 Star Trek film had it. It's still the highest grossing Star Trek film and also got very positive reviews from critics and audiences establishing that its fresh yet familiar reinterpretation of the franchise's classic era had the commercial and creative potential to sustain perhaps as many as five or six films, but definitely at least four. The first one made $258 million domestically and a total of $386 million worldwide. That's more than enough to just 
justify four films. That's one film and three sequels. What is that? That's nothing in today's entertainment ecosystem. The Fast and the Furious made significantly less than that, both domestically and internationally, and it's had nine sequels to date. Nine sequels. What gave Star Trek IV The Voyage Home such crossover appeal? There are several factors that combined to make it the right movie at the right time for the right number of people. Let's remember the context in which the film was produced and released. It was the mid-1980s. The creators of Star Trek IV, primarily producer and co-writer Harv Bennett, co-writer Nicholas Meyer, and director Leonard Nimoy, who also contributed to the story and, of course, plays Spock, made a film that reflected what the general audience at the time, not just Trekkies, but the general audience, wanted to see. One thing the movie going public in the 1980s wanted to see was time travel. Just think of all the time travel movies that were popular in the years right before and right after the release of Star Trek IV. Back to the Future, The Terminator, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Time Bandits, plus films that weren't box office successes but were critically acclaimed and are still well thought of today, like Somewhere in Time or Time After Time, which was also written and directed by Nicholas Meyer. In fact, it was the first film Meyer directed, and it's the reason he got the job directing Star Trek II. And in addition to all those films, there are others like The Final Countdown, which didn't do particularly well critically or commercially, but which we still remember for one reason or another. Star Trek IV was a time travel movie released in the middle of a time travel movie boom. And let's not forget, this was before time travel in Star Trek had become such a tired, worn-out plot device. Sure, some of the best-remembered episodes of the original series had involved time travel, but the movies had never gone to that particular well. Star Trek IV was the first time. But it wasn't just that Star Trek IV is a time travel story. It owes a big part of its success to how it tells that story. Star Trek IV picks up where Star Trek III leaves off, with the crew of the late Starship Enterprise, including the freshly re-alived Spock, on Vulcan. It's been a nice little vacation, but Kirk and the others know it's time to hop into their commandeered Klingon ship and head back to Earth to face the music for sabotaging the Excelsior, stealing and subsequently destroying the Enterprise, and violating the restrictions regarding the Genesis planet. So that's what they do. But their voyage home uh, ends in an unexpected crisis as they arrive to find Earth seemingly under attack from a massive space probe of unknown origin. The probe is causing all kinds of atmospheric havoc while transmitting a signal that no one can figure out how to translate. No one, that is, until Spock studies the signal for like a minute and works out that it's being sent in the language of humpback whales. Spock also theorizes that the probe's intentions aren't hostile, that it may not realize the harm it's causing to Earth, and that all that may be necessary to get it to stop is to reply to its message. The one tiny flaw in this plan is that it's the 23rd century and humpback whales are extinct. So Kirk's like, okay, no problem. We'll just do that thing where we fly around a star really fast and travel back in time. We'll go to a previous era of Earth history before humpbacks were extinct, and grab one and bring it back here so it can tell the probe to cut it out. And that's what they do, and it works. The human adventure continues some more. Happy holidays, folks. All right, it's a little more involved than that. They do the time warp slingshot thing and wind up back in 1986. Coincidentally, the same year people who first saw the movie were in at the time. The crew splits up and heads into 20th century San Francisco on three separate but related missions. Team One, consisting of Kirk and Spock, searches for humpback whales to take back to the 23rd century. Team 2, consisting of Uhura and Chekhov, attempts to locate a source of radioactive material that can be used to recharge their ship's dilithium crystals and enable them to travel back to their own time. Team 3, consisting of McCoy, Scotty, and Sulu, is tasked with obtaining the materials needed to construct a tank inside the ship capable of transporting the whales should Team 1 successfully locate them. If any one of these teams fails, then the overall mission fails, and the Earth of the future is doomed to be sung to death by interplanetary marine mammals. Accordingly, all three teams and their objectives 
are equally important, but Team One's got Kirk and Spock, so we're going to spend most of our time with them. You get it, right? Kirk and Spock discover that a local aquarium has two captive humpback whales, George and Gracie. So they hop on a bus, hilarity ensues as Spock uses the Vulcan neck pinch on a punk rocker who refuses to turn down that damn noise, and Kirk gives Spock an introductory lesson in the use of profanity, and when they arrive at the aquarium, they meet the resident whale expert, Dr. Jillian Taylor, and Spock slips away from a tour group to take a swim with the whales. While in the tank, Spock mind melds with one of the whales, let's say Gracie for the sake of the bit I'm about to do, and when he gets out, Kirk and Jillian run up to him, and Jillian's pissed because swimming with the whales isn't allowed, and Kirk's pissed because they're time travelers, and if they get thrown in jail for unauthorized swimming with whales, then they can't complete their mission and return to their own century. So they both come at Spock like, what was all that about? And Spock says, I was communicating with the whales. What did it look like? Kirk and Spock get kicked out of the aquarium, but as they're walking down the road a bit later, Jillian pulls up alongside in her truck and takes pity on them and offers them a ride. And during the ride, Jillian's like, so seriously, what were you trying to do swimming with my whales back there? And Spock's like, like I said, I was trying to communicate. We need a favor from the whales, and I was just asking to see if they wanted to help, because it would be pretty messed up for us to just draft them into our service for our own purposes without giving them a choice. Oh, also, Gracie is pregnant. And Jillian's like, what? How could you possibly know that? And Spock's like, because Gracie told me? And apparently George didn't know yet, because his reaction was a lot like yours just now. He went, what? And Gracie was like, that's right, George, I'm pregnant. And George said, is it mine? And Gracie said, of course it's yours. We're the only two whales here. And George said, I couldn't be sure. There was that time a few months ago when they moved you to a separate tank. And Gracie said, that was a medical segregation, so I wouldn't catch leptospirosis from you. It was at that point that I thanked them both for their cooperation and terminated the mind meld. They told you all of this in... What, whale speech? It was telepathic, so whale thought. What does whale thought sound like? It's just English. Jillian and Kirk drop Spock off at the park where the spaceship from the future is parked with the cloaking device turned on so it's invisible. Then they go out for pizza, and while they're talking, Kirk's communicator beeps, and it's Scotty with an update on one of the other team's mission. And Kirk tries to play it cool, but civilians carrying around long-range, pocket-sized walkie-talkies isn't really a thing in 1986, so Jillian's like, what's your deal anyway? Your weirdo friend says he can read the minds of my whales. You carry around a two-way radio. You're dressed funny. I've heard your aforementioned weirdo friend call you Admiral a few times. Are you from outer space? No, not at all. Don't be ridiculous. I don't know where you get that from, but no, absolutely not. I am not from outer space. Are you, though? Okay, yes, I am, but technically I'm from Iowa and I only work in outer space. Also, I'm from the future and I came to steal your whales, but for a good reason. And Spock asked if they wanted to help us and apparently they said yes, so I think you've kind of got to let me have this one. Jillian throws a bit of a wrench into Kirk's plans by telling him that George and Gracie are scheduled to be released back into the open sea tomorrow at noon, meaning Kirk and crew are on a much tighter schedule than they realized. Fortunately, Team 3's mission to get materials to build a whale tank in the ship has gone off without a hitch, thanks to Sulu, um... Stealing a helicopter, I guess. And McCoy and Scotty obtaining the plexiglass walls they need by going to the glass factory and trading knowledge of how to make transparent aluminum for the products they need. McCoy does briefly caution Scotty about giving someone in the 20th century the formula for transparent aluminum since to do so would alter the future. But Scotty counters with, how do we know this guy didn't invent it in the first place? Which is fantastic time traveler logic. The technical term for this is a predestination paradox, or a causality loop. Instead of getting all uptight about the temporal prime directive and the butterfly effect and blah blah blah, just assume that everything you do in the past is something that was supposed to happen, because the future is the result of the past, and you're in the past now. So whatever you do now is already in the past of the future you come from. So just go nuts. Give someone from the past knowledge of the future? Don't worry about it. 
accidentally leave advanced technology behind when you returned to your own century? You were meant to do that. Cause a whole bunch of shit to happen that absolutely would not have happened if you weren't there? You're not changing history, you're making history. It's not nearly as dramatically compelling because it eliminates a major source of tension, but it's a hell of a lot more fun. Back to our story, Team 3 does a bang-up job with its mission, but unfortunately Team 2 can't complete its mission without getting banged up. Uhura and Chekhov sneak onto an atomically powered Navy ship, a nuclear vessel, if you will, to collect the radioactive particles they need to juice up the Klingon ship's dilithium crystals, but they get caught and Scotty is only able to beam Uhura back before the guards show up. Chekhov is arrested and interrogated. He attempts to escape, but falls down and hits his widow head and is rushed to the hospital. Things get even more complicated when Jillian shows up, finds the invisible spaceship in the park, gets beamed inside, and tells Kirk that the whales have already been taken and are probably in open waters near Alaska by now. So first, they have to go rescue Chekhov and also fix his life-threatening head injury, which is no problem for 23rd century medicine. It's such a breeze that Dr. McCoy even has time to stop off and grow this old lady a new kidney. Then they fly to Alaska and beam up George and Gracie seconds before one of them is harpooned by whalers. Also, Jillian decides to abandon her life in the 20th century and go to the future with her whales, and everyone's pretty much fine with it because causality loop, stress-free time travel, yeah, baby. I mean, except for the stress of almost failing in your incredibly important mission and one of your people nearly dying from a cracked skull, but that shit happens when you're not time-traveling, too. Anyway, they rescue Chekhov, they beam up the whales, their dilithium crystals are recharged, they fly around the sun in the opposite direction of the way they flew to get here, which, as everyone knows, is how you travel to the future, and return to the 23rd century shortly after they left, just in time to land in San Francisco Bay and release George and Gracie so they can respond to the probe signal and tell it to chill the fuck out. Later, Kirk and his crew stand before the Federation Council, and the president is like, you did a lot of crimes in the last movie, which wasn't cool, but then in this movie, you saved the world, so we're just gonna bust Kirk from admiral to captain and call it even, okay? Oh, also, we got you a new spaceship, so go have fun. And they do. Presumably. At some point. What matters is, we have fun when we watch the movie. Yes, Star Trek IV is a time travel movie that was made during a period when time travel movies were really popular. It's also an action comedy, and those were big in the 1980s too, 48 Hours, Beverly Hills Cop, as well as many films that did not star Eddie Murphy, who was attached to Star Trek IV at one point, by the way. It's the only Star Trek film to date which I think can fairly be described as a comedy, not just a mostly dramatic movie with some comic relief. However, Focusing on the fact that the movie falls into then-popular categories makes it sound market-researched and focus-grouped, which, yeah, it was, and I don't want to act like the market research the producers did while deciding what Star Trek IV was going to be had nothing to do with its success, but the best, most accurate market research in the world isn't going to help if people don't like the movie when they finally see it. Most people who saw Star Trek IV in 1986 liked it. Most people who have seen it since then seem to like it. There are all kinds of reasons for that. Taste is a very personal, very subjective thing. But for me, the movie's broad and enduring appeal boils down to the fact that it's funny, it's fun to watch, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it's accessible and comprehensible to a general audience. This is the fourth Star Trek movie, but for many people who saw it during its original theatrical run, it was their first Star Trek movie. They, or the majority of them anyway, were still able to enjoy the movie, to connect with its characters, to get invested in its story, because it's not the sort of movie that requires you to have done the homework first. Sure, if you've seen the first three films, you might get more out of it than someone who's never seen a Star Trek movie before, but that's not a requirement. The movie builds on existing stories that began in the previous films, but it's not fussy about canon or continuity. It's not preoccupied with lore and world building and fan service and all the other elements that tend to clog up more recent entries in long-running franchises like Star Trek, because certain present-day creators, though for sure not all of them, 
have forgotten that a thing like world building is better when done at the service of the characters and the story, not the other way around. Leonard Nimoy, Harv Bennett, Nick Meyer, and the other creators of Star Trek IV know what's important and what's not. The threads of this movie that are pulled in from the previous entries in the series are things like character arcs and important past actions resulting in consequences. It's not so much that Star Trek IV is a direct continuation of the earlier films, but more that it acknowledges that the events of those films happened and allows them to shape the events of this film in ways that are meaningful to established fans and understandable for novices. The most conspicuous example of this is the characterization of Spock. He's still more or less himself. If you've never seen Star Trek before and you watch this movie, you'll recognize the character from his reputation. He's the calm, unemotional one, the rational one, the deadpan one. But he's still getting back up to speed after coming back from the dead in Star Trek III. He's less sure of himself. He takes everything literally. He's flummoxed by the subtleties of personal interactions. At times, he has an innocent, almost childlike quality. He also reverts back to a dependence on logic, lacking the more typically human characteristics he had acquired over the years. Reclaiming those human parts of himself, his intuition, his sense of humor, his willingness to go beyond pure logic and take risks, becomes the heart of Spock's character arc in the movie. His plot is new. What happened in Star Trek III has almost nothing directly to do with what happens in Star Trek IV, but his characterization in Star Trek IV starts where it ended in Star Trek III and develops from there. That combination of a standalone plot and continuing character arcs applies not only to Spock, but to the entire film. Star Trek IV tells an original, self-contained story that is compelling and exciting in its own right, and it also builds on and pays off plot threads and character beats that were established in the previous films. That's what enables it to appeal to people who don't really care about Star Trek as a thing, but just want to watch an amusing and entertaining sci-fi adventure movie, and longtime devoted Trekkies who have memorized all this shit. The creators of Star Trek IV do both the general audience and the hardcore fans another favor by making this movie such a dramatic change of pace from the preceding entries in the film series. Star Trek The Motion Picture is long, ponderous, and self-important. Star Treks II and III are both well-paced pulp sci-fi adventures with nicely timed points of levity sprinkled throughout. But they each have some pretty heavy moments as well. The death and funeral of Spock in Star Trek II, the murder of David and destruction of the Enterprise in Star Trek III. Compared to that, Star Trek IV is a romp through the pumpkin patch. Sure, there are high stakes, fate of the planet Earth and all, but the overall tone is light, comedic, even kind of zany at times. I'm not saying that makes it better than the previous films. That's a matter of opinion, as always, and it's not the point here. The point here is it's different. This is the fourth Star Trek movie, which might not sound like such a big deal nowadays when we're sitting on, what, 30-something movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, plus all the streaming series, and there are 11 Star Wars movies with more on the way, plus all those streaming series, and... Shit, they made like 15 movies in the DC Extended Universe, even though most of those are so bad. Oh, and they've made nine more Star Trek movies since Star Trek IV. So many that they rebooted the series, which means that the next Star Trek movie will also be Star Trek IV. Unless they reboot it again, or shift back to the Prime Universe and abandon the Kelvin timeline after three films worth of financial and, more importantly, creative investment. But why would they do that? Why would anyone think it makes sense to do that? Anyway, four movies in a film series is still a lot, is what I'm saying. Four movies in. Even the most exciting and innovative franchise runs a serious risk of getting stale. But Star Trek avoided that for one movie, thanks to the creators of Star Trek for putting in a conscious effort to keep their film fresh. Not only is this the fourth Star Trek film, it was released 20 years after the premiere of Star Trek on TV. These same actors have been playing these same characters for 20 years. And yet so much of Star Trek IV is new. New ship. New locations. New tone. Let's take those one at a time. New ship. 
the Klingon ship the heroes captured at the end of Star Trek III, which Kirk's crew rechristens the Bounty, takes the place of the Enterprise. It's smaller, darker, less inviting. It's also less durable, which is why Uhura and Chekhov end up on a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier siphoning photons out of the gas tank so they can make the return trip through time. It does have some advantages over the Enterprise, though. The cloaking device comes in handy for sure. There's another new ship at the very end of the movie, when Starfleet assigns Kirk and crew to the freshly christened Enterprise A, and it's even newer than the Bounty, because even though it wasn't named that yet, the Bounty was introduced in Star Trek III. We don't spend much time on the new Enterprise, though. We get literally one shot of the crew on the bridge, and then they warp away to the closing credits. New locations. Besides the Bounty, which serves as a headquarters for the protagonists and where a good chunk of the action takes place, almost every location in the film is a place we've never seen before. The only exception is Vulcan, which is where the crew ended up at the end of Star Trek III, but they only hang around there for a short while at the very beginning of the film. From there, it's straight to Earth, which we've never seen much of in Star Trek, especially by this point. And after a few short scenes set on 23rd century Earth to establish it and introduce the threat of the probe, our heroes show up in their captured Klingon ship, and before too long, they've slingshotted back in time, and there they are running around the streets of 1980 San Francisco. Star Trek has gone back to this particular well a few times since, in the Star Trek Voyager episode Future's End, with mixed results, in the second season of Star Trek Picard, with creative nadir of the entire franchise results, and in the second season Star Trek Strange New Worlds episode Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, with outstanding results. So this aspect of the film doesn't feel as fresh now as it did then, but the sight of Kirk, Spock, and the other heroes of classic Trek wandering through the streets of an actual city in the present day remains inherently interesting. Because of the premise of the show, it's not often that a Star Trek production gets to shoot on location where the location isn't meant to represent something else. Before and after Star Trek IV, we've seen lots of examples of Trek shows and movies that were shot outside of sound stages or studio backlots, but the locations are always standing in for some imaginary place. That's not Vasquez Rocks in California, it's the planet where Kirk fought the Gorn! That's not Toronto. It's an Illyrian city in the Volterra Nebula. That's Toronto. But in Star Trek IV, they shot on location in San Francisco, and it's supposed to be San Francisco. That not only infuses the film with an energy and an authenticity of a kind Star Trek productions rarely have, it also flips one of the fundamental premises of the entire series in a way that I find kind of ingenious. From the opening narration of the very first episode of Star Trek ever broadcast, we've been told that the mission of these characters is to explore strange new worlds. They do that in Star Trek IV, but this time the world they explore is strange to them, but it isn't strange to any of us. Well, okay, it might seem strange to some of you youngsters watching it today, because 1986 was almost 40 years ago, but it wasn't that different. For once, the audience is more familiar with the planet Kirk and his crew are visiting than they are. That's a whole new dynamic. If we're experienced viewers of Star Trek, we've seen Kirk, Spock, and the others confused or confounded by what they find on the planet they're exploring, but in Star Trek IV, they're confused and confounded by stuff that we all take for granted, like cars and money and keyboard and mouse-based computer interfaces. It places the audience in a position of knowing more than the characters do, but in a way that endears the characters to the audience and creates opportunities for comedy. And there's that new tone. Besides the changes in scenery and tone, we also get to see these characters and the actors who play them stretching themselves more than they typically get to. It's nice to see the classic Trek cast have a chance to play some comedy, which they're all good at. And they've all done before, only not quite so much in the movies up to this point. It's also fun to see the crew split up into some unfamiliar pairings. Kirk and Spock are an established duo, and they spend most of the movie together, but so do McCoy and Scotty two characters we haven't seen spend much time with each other. And they're a fantastic comedy team. 
Uhura and Chekhov is another pairing we aren't used to seeing, and they are also a lot of fun together. How do you not love that scene of them asking passersby for directions to the naval base? Unfortunately, that leaves poor Sulu as the odd man out, but at least he gets to fly a stolen helicopter. There's one more aspect of Star Trek IV that is new, which I want to highlight. It's not always as noticeable as the other elements I was talking about a second ago, but it's just as important. The musical score. Composed by Leonard Rosenman, the score of Star Trek IV is almost entirely new. The familiar Alexander Courage Star Trek theme is present only very briefly at the beginning and the end of the film. Rosenman's score, more playful and stylistically diverse than any other Star Trek score, with a unique and immediately recognizable main title theme, gives the film a voice all its own. By the time he was hired to score Star Trek IV, Rosenman was a prolific and celebrated film composer, having written music for dozens of films, including East of Eden, Rebel Without a Cause, Fantastic Voyage, Barry Lyndon, and Bound for Glory, winning Oscars for the last two. He was nominated for an Oscar for his Star Trek IV score as well, making Star Trek IV one of only two Star Trek films ever nominated for the Best Original Score Oscar, the other one being Star Trek The Motion Picture. Rosenman wrote the music, so he deserves most of the credit, but a small share of it should also go to Leonard Nimoy, who not only hired Rosenman, but requested that he write something original instead of relying on familiar Star Trek themes. It's one of countless examples of what made Leonard Nimoy so indispensable to his era of Star Trek. Not only did he play Spock, not only did he direct two of the best movies, not only did he help to develop the story of two of the best movies, he shares a story credit on four and six, underneath all of that and his many other contributions, Leonard Nimoy got it. He approached Star Trek like a storyteller, and he understood what it was, why it worked, and what it had to do to continue working. He knew that in order to survive, it had to evolve. It couldn't be content to repeat itself or reference itself. Its creators had to do the same thing its heroes were commissioned to do. As the crew of the Enterprise sought out new life and new civilizations, the creators of Star Trek had to seek out new stories and new ways of telling stories. That attitude, that dedication to taking Star Trek and doing something new with it, something different than what has been done before, is evident throughout Star Trek IV. But at the same time, it's still recognizable as Star Trek. And that's not just because Kirk and Spock and the others are running around on screen, it's because the story of Star Trek IV, though it is a departure in lots of ways, at its core is classic Star Trek. It's optimistic. It's political it's progressive, and its heart is on its sleeve. The political content of Star Trek IV comes in the form of something else that, like time travel and action comedy, was big in the 80s. Environmentalism. I don't mean to imply that environmentalism isn't big today or that it's no longer important. It is. It's just that nowadays, most environmental activism that gets mainstream attention is related to climate change. Which is understandable, since eventually climate change is going to kill us all unless we do something about it. So, like I said, eventually climate change is going to kill us all. But back in the 1980s, climate change, or global warming as it was usually called in those days, was only one of many environmental issues that routinely got prominent coverage in the press. Among the most popular environmentalist causes of the time were efforts to rescue endangered species from extinction, and perhaps the most ubiquitous of those was the movement to save the whales. When I was growing up, you could not avoid that simple three-word plea. Save the whales. It was everywhere. They talked about it on the news. Celebrities brought it up on talk shows all the time. There were high-profile fundraisers and benefits. Activist organizations like Greenpeace and the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society engaged in direct action against whalers. In 1986, members of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society sank two Icelandic whaling ships. If all that's not enough to convince you that saving the whales was a big deal in the mid-80s, I have one more piece of evidence, which is that they made a Star Trek movie about it, and it was the most successful Star Trek movie ever. 
and the fifth highest grossing movie in the world that year. Still the highest placing Star Trek film in a year-end worldwide box office list. By the way, in the finest tradition of the franchise, Star Trek IV has our heroes confronting and asking us to confront one of our failings as a society. When the mysterious space probe rolls up to Earth hoping to have a nice chat with some humpback whales, it finds that there ain't no humpback whales. Why? because we hunted them to extinction sometime in the 21st century. So, Kirk and his crew have to travel back in time to before their extinction, collect some humpbacks, and bring them to the 23rd century to prevent the probe from destroying humanity, or, as the Federation president puts it in his closing statement at the end of the film, Captain Kirk, you and your crew have saved this planet from its own short-sightedness. Hey, maybe Kirk and the gang wouldn't have needed to fly that commandeered Klingon shitbox back in time 300 years if people in the 20th century, like the ones watching the movie in 1986, had done more to keep humpback whales and other endangered species, just to play it safe, from going extinct in the first place. More importantly, maybe we should do more to preserve species endangered by human activities and take better care of the natural world, generally speaking, since this is real life and there's no Captain Kirk to swing by from the future and bail us out. So, to recap, Star Trek IV takes advantage of what were at the time popular trends in the movie industry. It tells a story that is both fun and funny, that is easily accessible to a general audience, but still rewarding to longtime fans as well. And even though it's the fourth entry in the film series and was released 20 years after the premiere of the original TV series, it feels different and fresh and breathes new life into the entire franchise. But... There is one more piece to this puzzle, one more aspect of Star Trek IV that accounts for its great success at the time of its release and its enduring popularity. Star Trek IV is simultaneously a well-crafted and satisfying ending to a larger story and an intriguing new beginning. Star Treks 2, 3, and 4 are sometimes referred to as the Genesis Trilogy, named after the Genesis device, the MacGuffin in Star Trek 2, which creates the short-lived planet that brings Spock back to life in Star Trek 3, and which has nothing to do with Star Trek 4, but it picks up right where Star Trek 3 leaves off, and the Genesis Trilogy is a cool name. Even though the trilogy isn't heavily serialized, each entry stands alone as a complete story, collectively, the three films do make up their own section of the overall film series. Their three stories all take place along the same arc, and they are more closely tied to each other by plot, characterization, and themes than they are to the rest of the franchise. Star Trek IV makes an excellent concluding chapter to the trilogy largely because it is such a change of pace from the others. Like I've said already, the occasional quip or gag aside, Star Trek II and Star Trek III are both fairly serious and occasionally kind of heavy. Star Trek IV is the emotional release, the lifting of the weight, the catharsis, the reassurance that, yeah, we've been through some grim shit lately, but we're still here, and it's all going to be okay. The Voyage Home is the right title for this one. It gives us and its major characters a sense of completion. After losing his best friend, his son, his ship, and his career, Kirk finds himself on the bridge of a new enterprise, surrounded by his crew, his surrogate family. Kirk's regret over accepting promotion to Admiral and being removed from command of a starship is also resolved. In Star Trek II, both McCoy and Spock urge him to find a way to get back in command of a ship. Spock calls it his first best destiny. At the end of Star Trek IV, Kirk is poised to once again fulfill that destiny. Loss, recovery, renewal. Spock gives his life for his friends in Star Trek II, is returned to life by his friends in Star Trek III, and saves the world with his friends in Star Trek IV. Death, resurrection, redemption. As the freshly recommissioned Captain Kirk says to his crew as they approach their new enterprise, My friends, we've come home. Earth has been saved, Spock is alive, they're all back in uniform, and the successor to their beloved ship is waiting to carry them back to the stars. The circle has been closed. And at the same time, another circle has been opened. A new journey has begun, and new adventures await. 
The commercial and critical success of Star Trek IV guaranteed that it would not be the last Star Trek movie, but if it had been, it would have made an excellent finale. As it happened, it made for an excellent fresh start, becoming the gateway to a continuation of the film series and a whole new generation of Star Trek. And sure, the next steps down both of those roads were a little shaky. There was a stumble or two, but they figured it out soon enough. And now here we are 37 years later with so much more Star Trek to watch, much of it quite good. The old saying is, third time's the charm, but Star Trek IV The Voyage Home proves that the fourth movie in a series can be pretty goddamn charming, too. Not always. In fact, if the history of popular cinema is any indication, hardly ever. But sometimes, you never know until you see the movie. But before you can see the movie, they've got to make the movie. So just... Just... <laughs> I just want to see Chris Pine play Captain Kirk one more time, man. That's all. That's just... <laughs> Santa! I have never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. But grant me my request. Grant me a fourth Star Trek movie set in the Kelvin timeline. And if you do not listen, then double dumbass on you. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons, they are Jim Luke Pickerk, thanks Jim Luke, Lessons Learned, thanks Lessons Learned, Sue Ward, thanks Sue, Fiona Matthews, thanks Fiona, Brent Kraft, thanks Brent. Prince of Void, thanks Prince of Void. Screaming Slave 99, thanks Screaming Slave 99. Donovan Campbell, thanks Donovan. Bootleg PBJ, thanks Bootleg PBJ. Frank Santoyo, thanks Frank. UW Tartarus, thanks UW Tartarus. And now for the new channel members. They are Zila9, thanks Zila9. Trinity, thanks Trinity. Timothy Willard, thanks Timothy. Kitsap Craig, thanks Kitsap. Andreas Olson, thanks Andreas. Matthew Gretzinger, thanks Matthew. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek-related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch-along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, Next month is the start of a new year, so it's fitting that next month's topic will be somewhat of a departure from what I've been doing with this series lately. These last few months, the Trek Actually videos have been more narrowly focused about particular characters or particular works within the Star Trek franchise. Next month's topic is broader demanding a survey of characters from across the many series and films that make up Star Trek. Additionally, can I just tell you that this month's vote was a nail-biter. 
As those of you who are patrons and members and have voted in the Trek Actually topic polls before know, I use an instant runoff voting website to conduct the polls. This time, the vote went through four rounds before a winner was chosen. The ultimately winning topic finished third in the first round, second in the second round, tied for second in the third round, and finally won the fourth and deciding round. Pretty exciting. Anyway, I guess I should actually tell you what the topic is. It's who are actually Star Trek's greatest BFFs? So many candidates. That's going to be a fun one. That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching. Take care and happy holidays, everybody.